we are continuing this series where we're walking through uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is really talking about his kingdom, and it's an upside-down kingdom, right? It doesn't really, um, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to us right now in the way that we're living, but Jesus explains it in a way where it's clear he's turning everything topsy-turvy. Um, according to um, Richard Stearns, who's the president of World Vision, the person who's had the greatest single impact on addressing global poverty in the past 25 years is a largely unknown World Vision staffer. Anybody know what his name is? That's why he's unknown. His name is Steve Reynolds. And in 1985, a young Steve Reynolds was working in Ethiopia during what was the worst famine of a generation. And Steve had spent many dreary days uh, in the relief camps as an eyewitness to the horrors of massive starvation and death. He gathered information that, that he hoped would provoke people to notice and to respond. And one day, uh, Steve got a call from headquarters asking if he would host this young European couple, Allie and Paul Houston, uh, who wanted to visit and learn firsthand about what was happening. And Steve was willing to help. And Allie and Paul came. They stayed almost a, a month. They just kind of rolled up their sleeves to help. They're showing this tireless compassion. Now, the thing about it was Paul was a musician, and he entertained the kids in the camp by writing little songs, and Paul and Allie eventually went home, but not before they committed to do whatever they could to help. You probably know Paul by his other nickname, Bono. And since that 1985 trip, Bono, who's the lead singer of probably the greatest rock band of all time, no comparison, you, know, you can't really put anybody next to you two, they are the best band ever in all time, I don't care what anybody says, actually none of that's in my notes, that's just what I think about you two. Um, but he has traveled the globe as an advocate for the poorest of the poor. He's met with kings and queens, presidents, prime ministers, and the pope. He's lobbied members of parliaments and congresses. He's persuaded governments to appropriate billions of dollar to aid, dollars to aid the poor. But in a later interview with Christianity Today, Bono specifically mentioned the key influence of Steve Reynolds. Bono said, all this started for me in Ethiopia in the mid-1980s when my darling wife and I went out there, as children really, to see and to work in Africa. 20 years later, 20 years plus later, Steve Reynolds, he still worked for World Vision. He served in numerous jobs, working behind the scenes on behalf of the world's poorest people. Steve was willing and available to be used however God wanted to use him. Here's what I want you to get from today as we talk about this upside-down kingdom living. The path to right living for the upside-down kingdom citizen means living our lives in a way that avoids at all cost highlighting and spotlighting the spiritual disciplines of giving, praying, and fasting that Jesus clearly expects us to be part of and to be part of our everyday normal lives. Before we go any further, let's pray. So God, may we be a people who are willing to do what you have called us to do, to, to live lives openly, to, to, to love others without any condition, precondition. But Lord, may we do it in a way that's completely in line with what you call us to here in Matthew's Gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, as we, uh, we give, as we pray, as we fast, may we be challenged today to reconsider that anew. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, the right kind of living, as far as the upside-down kingdom is concerned, this is what it means. First thing it means, it means learning how to give secretly how to give secretly. 
we, we read these words, be careful, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what's done in secret, will reward you. Jesus is explaining to those who are listening that being a citizen of his upside-down kingdom necessitates a righteousness. Another word, have you ever heard the word piety? Piety? It necessitates a piety that's of a higher order. It's also critical to understand exactly what Jesus is not saying. Just as we discussed a few weeks ago regarding the, the teaching that Jesus gave on the triple threat, there was a triple threat to community, when we talked about what's going on in our hearts. The issue here is not about being known, but rather, what is our intent? What are our intentions? Are we doing this good deed in order to be seen by others? To be recognized by others? Because we want others to think well of us? Because if our intent is to be seen, Jesus is telling us quite clearly that the result of that might be the approval of others, the esteem of others, but God will step aside, not pay any attention at all. Now, I don't want us to be fooled by this either, okay, at the same time. Giving in Jesus' day was indeed a significant aspect of what it meant to be an observant Jew, what it meant to be a practicing Jew, someone who practiced the faith with seriousness, with sincerity. And now the word that's used here in reference to giving is that word piety that I asked you about just a few seconds ago. It's this idea of charitable giving. Specifically, the Greek word is what appears here. The Greek word dikosony. Dikosony. And in the previous chapter, that word translates as righteousness. So righteousness. It would seem to follow that Jesus is calling kingdom citizens to a higher righteousness. In fact, Jesus is saying that it would indeed, that we should indeed practice acts of righteousness, or more literally, literally these are acts of justice on a regular basis, but not so that we can receive the pat on the back, so that we can receive the glory. Jesus clearly and frequently calls for us to give and to care for the needs of the poor. The phrase is, Did you catch that phrase? When. Jesus didn't say if. He didn't talk about if you feel like it, if you feel good about it. Jesus said when you give. Jesus here is demanding both this practice of piety, this practice of righteousness, this practice of giving and caring for the poor, and justice. And in just a few moments, we will read his expectation of personal intimacy with God as well. You know, Jesus used this word in his time, the word hypocrite. How many, you guys have heard that word, right? Hypocrite? Nobody's ever heard that word? Have you heard that word? Have you heard okay, you've heard that word, right? He, Jesus used that word multiple times in his earthly ministry. And in this case, he emphasizes the intentional practice of deceit. Now, interestingly enough, in Jesus' day, Folks knew hypocrite referred to someone who was an actor. Not necessarily even a negative thing. It it was probably a good thing to be called a hypocrite because that meant you were a good, good actor. Jesus takes that and spins it around a bit. Jesus is saying, don't pretend. Don't put on an act for someone else to see. So there's this guy named Dean uh, Gunther. He's a tattoo artist. Currently, he lives in Manchester, England, which is where all the good tattoo artists live, I guess. I don't know. Well, he had a client come to him recently, and uh, he had this really bold idea. He was really stoked about this idea. Dean was. And so Dean did the work for free, right? He, He gave this tattoo for free. The client was a friend of his who hates to work out. 
but he wanted to have the look of a well-toned six-pack set of abdominal muscles. So he asked Gunther to tattoo the look onto his stomach. And Gunther said this, he said, I had seen really bad ones attempted before because, and because I specialize in color realism, I wanted to give it a go. Of course, it wasn't only the technical challenge that got him on board. He also had additional motivation. He said, I thought it'd be funny. Once they completed the two-day project, two days, a two-day project, they took a video and then they shared it on TikTok to verify the rapidly spreading rumor of the six-pack tat, which looks really impressive from a distance. Gunther's followers responded with a combination of disbelief and bemused speculation. And, and one user summed up the approach with a simple, um, he said, uh, if you can't tone it, tat it. <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, going to church and at the offering time, the offering baskets being up at the front of the sanctuary, and when offering time came, the expectation was that while the music was being played or sung, you would get in line along the side wall, and you would walk forward to place your offering uh, in the offering baskets, which I recall it wasn't just some table up at the front, but when you got up to the front, there were people holding the baskets for you to put your offering in. I was just a little kid, but I clearly remember the feelings of embarrassment, um, envy, because I didn't have any money to place into the offering. I, I thought it was strange because it was pretty easy to see who was and who was what. Not. <laughs> who was not giving offering. You could look around and see. Now, maybe there are people who were going up and just placing empty envelopes in the baskets just to make sure they were being seen, you know, to be seen. Seems like we were, in fact, not doing what Jesus calls his kingdom people to do. Jesus is calling us beyond the action. Dallas Willard says he's actually calling us out by pointing to the source of character. How deep has the transforming power of life with God taken root in our lives? I want to be clear about something, too. I need to just take a quick time out, okay? Jesus is not critical of being publicly acknowledged. It's not, that's not what's going on here. It's okay to be publicly acknowledged. He just wants to know our motive. Why? Why we want to be publicly acknowledged. Did we give what we gave for the express purpose of being publicly acknowledged and praised by others? If so, if so, if the answer to that is yes, that's the problem. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. So, being an upside-down kingdom citizen means learning how to give without any regard whatsoever for who else is looking, not just looking good for the sake of looking good. Learning to give actually in secret. Jesus continues on in this passage by explaining another key aspect of right kind of living as far as the upside-down kingdom is concerned. He says that the right kind of living means praying privately. Jesus said this, he said, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, Close the door and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And here's the thing. There are versions of this prayer both here in Matthew's gospel and then over in Luke's gospel, chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. There's evidence that Jesus really kind of adapts this form of a basic synagogue prayer that's called the Kaddish. And the prayer that's translated from Hebrew into English, it would read something like this. Exalted and hallowed be his great name. In the world he created according to his will, may he let his kingdom rule. Now listen, this is not the prayer of someone who's simply hanging out and hoping that they get the most out of this life. Rather, it's the prayer of someone who understands that we live in a world that is not what it should be and that only our Heavenly Father can make all things as they should be. And there's this word I came across in preparing this sermon that I really think it strikes at the heart of what Jesus is warning against here in this passage. The word comes from early Christian writers and uh, the Orthodox Church, actually. And uh, James Bryant Smith talks about this in his book, The Good and Beautiful Life. The word is vain glory. Vain. Has anybody ever heard that phrase, vain glory? One word, vain glory. It's actually considered to be the eighth deadly sin. To be added to the list of the seven deadly sins, you know, pride, envy, gluttony, greed, lust, sloth, and wrath. Vain glory moves us away from what we've learned, that like the Puritans, uh, early American history, they claimed as something central to their faith, living for, standing before what is referred to as an audience of one. So vain glory does not care about that audience of one. That's what the Puritans called uh, those among them to be focused on. So now, here's the thing. Vainglory masquerades as a virtue. Vainglory masquerades as a virtue. Think about it. You don't have to raise your hand now, and I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus, but think about, think about this. Think about the annual Christmas letter, right? You know the one where we alert everyone to all of our successes through the past year, right? You know, except as James Bryant Smith says, he says, what could be wrong with, with that? Nothing, right? Except that in many cases, the true intent of the author is to impress the reader with how wonderful uh, his or her family is. No one ever writes about the strain in marriage that a child's in therapy for an anxiety disorder or that a family member came in last in some vocal contest. We don't hear about suffering, the failing, the struggles, only the accomplishments. And Jesus here tells us, he says, find a private place. Close the door. Jesus tells us that the Father is the one we pray to. And not only does the Father see the secret, but he also says the Father himself is secret. The secret place is where God is. There we stand. Psalm 91 says, under the shadow of the Almighty. And here in this chapter, in Matthew chapter 6, by connecting hypocrites to public prayer. Jesus is in all likelihood thinking of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, the religious people of his day. And for evidence that we can find over in Luke's gospel, Jesus shares an example that is the direct opposite of the vain glory the Pharisees exhibit. Maybe you've seen this passage before. Let me, let me share it with you. This passage from Luke 18. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you. I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. 
and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Have you ever heard that before? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. If you haven't picked up on this yet, when Jesus speaks of having received their reward in full, what he's saying is when you show off on earth, when you show off on earth, there's no need for God in heaven to recognize what you've done. You got all you're going to get. You're good. Next. The upside down kingdom citizen is not, a, not under the control of the opinions of other people, who they are, how they are. It's why Jesus spends so much time talking about secrecy, the power it has to break us away from this grip of vain glory. We don't care what other people think or say about us. We have made a commitment to live our lives for that audience of one. The constraints of time would not allow me to really jump into so many of the things that Pastor Bryce reminded us of with regard to the Lord's Prayer that we find here in verses 10 through 13. But here's what you need to know. That prayer is a prayer of simple and complete dependence. Every last word of it is. It, you're throwing yourself completely on the mercy of God the Father. But if I may, Here's what I sense the Lord's teaching me in general about prayer. It, it fits particularly well with what we're discussing here today. There's a 19th century, early 20th century evangelist and pastor. You may have seen this name. Um, his name is uh, R.A. Torrey. And he says this. We are too busy to pray, and so we are too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little. Many services, but few conversions. Much machinery, but few results. Jesus teaches us here in Matthew 6 that the right kind of living, the upside down kingdom living, means giving secretly. The right kind of living means praying in private. Here's the last thing. The right kind of living means fasting regularly. Pick it up in verse 16. Jesus says this, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, Let's just be real about this whole fasting thing for a minute, okay? We'll just, be, we'll just be real honest. Most of us see this particular word from Jesus as pretty much optional, right? I mean, we do. Just honest. We, we, we see it as optional. It's especially difficult because we live in a culture that literally celebrates overindulgence, right? More is good, more is better, right? We do. Virtually everything in overindulgence. The idea of fasting from anything is just not going to be popular at all, right? Do you guys think I'm lying about that? If you do, just raise your hand. No, I'm just teasing. And right? I mean, fasting is just, we, we don't do it. And Jesus points to what was indeed a regular part of engaging in a time of fasting, the abstaining of food. That was something we read about. You read about that in the Old Testament all the time, don't you? The fasting. The Greek word that's used here is actually um, this practice of disfiguring one's face, uh, uh, wearing ashes, right? That, that phrase maybe fasting and 
you know, with ashes, you know. And the, the Bible literally translates the word here that's used for fasting to disfigure as to be unrecognizable. But that's the whole game, see? That's the whole game that Jesus is talking about. Religious people doing religious things in order to be seen. These hypocrites who are, what? What are hypocrites? They're actors. That Jesus is talking about, they found a way to distinguish themselves, to mark themselves so that when you saw them in public, what would you think? Oh, they're fasting. Oh, look at that. They must be fasting today. They must be fasting this week. Oh, look. I can, you can tell. They're fasting. Now, here's what a lot of us maybe inadvertently think when it comes to the issue of fasting. We think, is that something we really should do? Or we think, like, isn't that like a Roman Catholic thing to do? Or we think, does that seem really like a, or like a more Old Testament-y kind of thing to do? And of course, the answer to all those things is yes. Yeah. And it is indeed what we should engage in as spiritual practice discipline as well. Here's something I read about the practice of fasting that was really incredible, powerful. It's really powerful. It's really true. It's this. Fasting is in its own way a countercultural act. In the setting of the Roman Empire, a setting that's not unlike our own, economic structures served the rich elite and the powerful. They do not serve the 99%. That's everybody else. They don't serve everybody else. The poorest of the poor in particular are in desperate situations. The norm is greedy accumulation and self-indulgent consumption. The self-denial entailed in fasting is not only a spiritual discipline, but it is a countercultural act. In other words, when you engage in fasting, you're being countercultural. Look at you. Down with the system, man. I'm fasting. That's what it is. There is an online tool that I have used over the years to help me kind of prepare sermons, um, small group materials, etc. It's awesome because if, what happens is you put in a particular passage of Scripture or a topic, and the site, you guys know how the Internet works, right? I don't have to explain that to you. Y'all know how that happens. So it, it comes up with all this information on whatever you've put in. So just as an experiment on this site, I took the three things that Jesus indicates in this passage that are to be a means of right living for those of us who want to be citizens of this upside down kingdom. You know, giving, praying, and fasting. So this is a site that's dedicated to making sure that you have this spiritual information that you can share with people. Guess how many resources were returned when I put in the word giving? Anyone want to guess? How many resources do you think came up on the site? I'm taking bids. How many? How many resources do you think came up? Anybody? Shout a number out. Thousand? Five hundred? What? What else? What? One hundred. This how many came up? Over a thousand. On giving. Over a thousand. That's pretty impressive. That's good. That's to have a good word to say to those who love Jesus about giving. So, guess how many resources were returned when I put in the word praying? Anybody want to guess? I'm praying. Just out, throw them out. Anybody? 2,000. That's good. F how many? 2,500. Praying. Anybody else? Okay, great numbers. Well, here's the deal. A little bit over 700. That's still, that's still pretty good. That's still pretty good. That's a good number of hits, right? Anybody want to guess when I put in the word fasting? Ten, zero, seven. See, y'all get it. Y'all understand this. Actually, it's supposed to be 102. But 10 looks more impressive, doesn't it? 102. 
we go from 1,000 on really important topic, pray. We go to 700, really important topic, giving. 102. There's no doubt that when we examine the scriptures about this particular spiritual discipline, the examples, they're wide, they're varied. The Old Testament circumstances where there's a call to repent from sin. You know, people are weep, to weep and fast. Nehemiah, if you read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah called the people to weep, fast, and confess their sins. The people of Nineveh, Nineveh and Jonah, right? Nineveh and Jonah. Uh, they're supposed to repent through the preaching of Jonah. They're, at, they're told to, to fast and to wear sackcloth. Daniel. Daniel, who sought the will of God by praying and fasting and dressing in sackcloth. Just a quick note about sackcloth. This is why this is important. It's a really uncomfortable kind of cloth material. It's worn for the express purposes of serving as a physical reminder to the condition you find yourself in that, that lead to the point of repentance, prayer, and fasting. And it's very, very interesting that while Jesus has something negative to say, about the manner in which the hypocrites fasted, he did not have anything negative to say about fasting itself. Do you get that? He didn't have a problem with fasting, just the way that it was being done. But when you fast, Jesus says that we're to behave normally. In the time that Jesus was talking about people would look a certain way. Maybe for us, though, it means taking a shower when we're fasting, brushing our teeth, wearing deodorant, antiperspirant, lotion, cologne, nice clothes, going about our daily habits. But most importantly, most importantly, we remember that at the same time, we remember that Jesus himself knew that when we've learned to fast in secret, our bodies and our souls will be directly sustained by that invisible kingdom. We will not be miserable, but we will certainly be different. We will not be miserable, but we'll be different. Here's the thing I want us to think about as we kind of wrap up our time today, thinking about this whole idea of the right kind of living, the upside-down kingdom living. There's a writer by the name of Andy Crouch, and he said the spiritual disciplines, that's what these things would be giving, praying, fasting. The spiritual disciplines are so easy that any adult human can do them. There are no particular skills required to be alone, to be silent, or to abstain from food. Yet on the other hand, these are so difficult and so perfectly calibrated to reveal the true condition of our hearts that no one can succeed at them. Indeed, the secret of the classical spiritual disciplines and all the disciplines that, that, that tame power <laughs> is how reliably they lay waste to whatever sense we may have of ourselves as kind of these competent agents in the world. Take fasting and food, where I can offer a personal testimony, he goes on, to the humbling effect of disciplines. He says this, Andy Crouch says this, my annual fast during the seasons of Advent and Lent are darkly comical reminders of how completely undisciplined I truly am in my relationship with food. Can I get an amen? Right? No matter how minimal the fast I set out to practice, one Lent, he says, one Lent, it was simply leaving milk out of my tea. Now, personally, I don't know why you put milk in tea, but he wanted to leave milk out of his tea. And he said, I find that I am almost never able to keep it to the end. Among the most pitiful moments of my life was that day, about two weeks into Lent, when I desperately and furtively opened the refrigerator, fully aware I was breaking the most minimal fast conceivable, but feeling completely unable to go on without milk in my tea. He says it was the sweetest and the bitterest cup of tea I've ever had. 
when we practice the spiritual disciplines, we discover how deep runs our commitment to our own autonomy, comfort, how addicted we are to the approval of others, the sound of our own voice, and the satisfaction of our own appetites. Upside-down kingdom living requires we listen to a different voice, not our own. Pray with me. God, this is a challenge that so many of us, God, we can stick our hands up and admit, Lord, it, it is so difficult, a road to walk. Lord, this giving, praying, fasting, or just focusing not on ourselves, but on, on you. Not drawing attention to ourselves, but focusing on you. Not letting anyone know <laughs> that we're doing these things and trusting that you see us. God, this is, this is what you've called us to as kingdom citizens. Lord, as we grow in our ability to flesh out these spiritual disciplines, God, may you, may you be honored. May we be changed. And Lord, may the world know about you because of the way that we live. Now, God, we continue to strive to be what you've called us to be. Lord, that is upside down kingdom citizens. Work that just is perfected in us by your hand. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.